What is up, everybody? We're back with another episode of the Determined Society Podcast. And today, folks, I have a guest here that uh, we discovered we actually knew each other from way back in the day when we were youngsters roaming around, you know, Baton Rouge, LSU campus as two athletes. He was a track star. I was a baseball star. And we really found out how much we actually have in fucking common. And it was oh. hysterical, buddy, right? I, I have with me my boy, Matt Vincent. Uh, we'll get into his background, but damn, dude, what a doozy. What a doozy, man. Um, <laughs> it was really funny catching up. And then as soon as you called me back, right? And like we mm. got introduced and then you called me back and you're like, yeah, we know each other. And I'm like, oh, shit, do tell. Yeah, I know. You're like, man, I've traveled a ton over the last decade. Like, there's a fucking good chance, right? And uh, you tell me, like, the first thing you say, especially after we had chatted about, you know, both being at LSU at the same time Mm -hmm. doing athletics. And you fucking, you're like, uh, hey, who are you dating in college? And I'm like, oh, no. Did you know at that moment that I was that motherfucker? I fucking knew exactly who you were at that moment. (laughs) Oh, my God. So... Come to find out, um, I, in college, uh, mm-hmm. spent a few years dating a girl who, ha, huh, she's very fallacious, I would say. Very, um, yeah, she, yeah, she, <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, very, very accurate description of, um, of her. Thank you. It wasn't a great relationship. I didn't, mm-hmm. you know, I should have, I should have bailed a little earlier than I did. Um, oh, man. But, you know, she would cheat on me. She would get blackout drunk mm-hmm. and cheat on me. And then I would like have to locate her. And for some reason as a boy, Oh dude, more than once, oh, <laughs> more than once. This is, <laughs> um, our circumstance was unique, but she, she was a, uh, was a, a learning experience. Let's say I know yeah, a lot dude, of things I won't tolerate again. Yeah, no, I, I feel you on that one. It was just so crazy because like, as I'm getting off the phone with you the first time, I'm like, Oh shit. What if he knows? I'm like, I can't wait to talk to this guy again. If I call him oh, back right now, it's like, it's like, you know, it's going to be a little weird. So I'll wait until I'm like talking to him. And uh, again, and, but it was crazy. Like I started like recounting everything. There was a moment I'm going to tell you, dude, I, I don't, I've never told you this. You know, I don't think I told you that night when you showed up at my doorstep ready to fuck me up, guys. It was the scariest moment of my life. Just so we're clear. Was, I wasn't going to fight anyone. Like, that's not you my weren't? MO. I thought you, no, I man. Thought you no, I, I get that. But, yeah, like, what I, mean, I needed you know? yeah. was I needed to know what the fuck happened. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then I don't, then I can go ahead, let her lie to me, and then be like, yeah, we're done with this. And I'm pretty yeah. sure that's what was the final, like, we're fucking done here. Yeah, no, congratulations, Sean. You were the straw that broke the camel's back. Fantastic. But it was yes. nuts, dude, because there was, there was like weeks where, I would hear weird shit outside of my window and, and bro, I was scared as fuck. I didn't know what it was. I was calling my friends. I was like, bro, what are y'all fucking doing? Like, I can't even sleep in my room. Like one night I slept with the light on. Well, um, finally figure out where you live. I, I, we're going to get to that. Cause I want to know that. Cause you knew the exact motherfucking apartment. I'm like, I heard this bang and like Sean French here. I'm like, fuck, what did I do now? But, Here's the thing. So I, I keep hearing this shit out in front of my window because mine faced the pond, right? Yep. And finally one night I hear another rock hit it and I go, and I hear Sean, Sean. And I was like, that's a girl's voice. I should probably open up my window. And I'm like, okay, like, has it been you creeping around my window? <laughs> like, what the fuck is going on? I'm like, and, and, and young Sean's like, come on in. Right. Sure. I mean, you're not going to not open up the window is in the middle of the night. We're in college. You're like, whatever, man. So dude, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm like, this is, well, thank you. Um, so (laughs) I'm sitting there. So then like the, the, not, you know, anyway, so I just thought it was really strange. I was scared for weeks on end, but it was like, it it was her outside my window. Dude. Scary shit I've ever. So how did you find out where I lived? Y'all man, that's like, as soon as we spoke, it's like I, I opened up this filing cabinet in my head that, like, I haven't thought about in so fucking long, right? So, it's a little mm-hmm. sketchy, other than I think I had found some text. Gotcha. That, that's got to be how I yeah. got there. I that's found some crazy. text, and then maybe she had you had shared an address with her. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Like that's, Nuts, man. Yep. Yeah. I don't know. But, hey, so... I don't I remember, mean- and I, I, I may have... 
I may have called a friend. We had uh, like I had a girl on the track team with us, Mallory McDonald, and she lived in the oh, commons Mallory. too. Yeah, so Mallory yeah. and yeah. all those girls I knew really well too. And so I may have called and said like, "Hey, do you know where this guy lives?" That's so funny, dude. And so yeah, I just fucking cruised. I don't know why I rode my bike over there. That seems so weird now. Yeah, I, I mean, it, dude, it was crazy. That's like one thing I noticed. I think it was white. Yeah, it makes sense. I just don't know why I, I would have rode my bicycle. Like, literally, I just remember <laughs> you. And then like a like a like a little part of a bicycle frame. I'm like this motherfucker yeah. rode his bike over here. It's like holy shit. And I remember at that my, point, you know, like I I would have been living on Highland, like at uh, Place du Planche. That's pretty far. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty far. That was 2004, I believe. Late yeah, no, it would have been 2003. Yeah. It was 2003. It was 2003. Because I rolled yeah. out of there right after that. Yeah, I rolled out of there. I think that that winter was my last semester. Was it due to the stress of the situation? It was due to the stress of you showing up on a 10 speed. Um, fucking who's Sean French? I'm like, not me tonight, motherfucker. I ain't the guy. But um, it's, it's crazy, dude. And I think you came in for a little bit and we talked about it. And, yep. um, and then that was it. And then, you know, here you are 20 years later, my buddy Brad Johnson. Got to give him a shout out for setting up this cosmic event. and. Um, you know, I mean, God, it's been, it's been so freaking long, 20 years. And here we are on this, you know, recording and having this amazing conversation and uh, no blood being drawn. So it's always no, good. Man, and, and no blood being drawn then, right? Like I can't, No. even at that age, even at, you know, 22 or whatever I was, I'm glad to have enough sense about me that like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to be mad at this person who has no idea of the situation. Like, this isn't a personal attack against me. This guy mm -hmm. didn't see this girl and say, I'm going to fuck that dude's girl or whatever it is. Right. Like, yeah, no, you know, she was on the prowl. Dude, it was it was nuts, man. It was nuts. But you've been doing some amazing things, at, you know, since then. The Highland Games, uh, World Champion, two time clothing brand, amazing podcast, um, much more handsome. I would say now I'm like, fuck, I didn't even I'm like, no way it's that, that that's not, it can't be that motherfucker, dude. And then I just went and looked at, you know, photos and went back. I'm like, that is the dude. You look good, man. You Thank you, great. man. I appreciate Absolutely. it. You know, uh, yeah, my biggest, you know, doing strong man and chasing strength mm -hmm. sports after college, which was super fun. Mm -hmm. Um, I think my biggest, I got up to like three eighteen. Jesus, so, plenty strong. Um, yeah. I, so man, I had to go get a physical yesterday. I hope as an athlete, this fucking resonates for you. <laughs> I had to go get a physical yesterday, simple stuff. And, uh, like ran over to urgent care to get it done. That way, like mm -hmm. I can keep getting my HRT now that yeah, of course you yeah. have to get a physical every once in a while. Right. Yeah. And so she's doing like height and weight. Oh, and, you're uh, oh no, 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 no. They're, oh, okay. they're stoked. Right. So I'm okay. doing height and like, man, any recruiting shit in my entire life is like five eleven, scratching six foot. Right. I and she's it. like, uh, height, uh, six foot one. And I'm just now. Like, yeah. And so she says that like, she, she, she gave it fucking half a glance. I'm like, yeah, now you're she, this is not any official measurement for like a combine, right? Yeah. There's a girl working at urgent care who couldn't give any less of a fuck about dealing with oh, me. God. And she says six foot one and doesn't know what a gift she just handed me of like for yeah. the rest of my life. Thank now you. I will fucking Thank say you. official measurement. Yes. I'm yes. almost six, two, basically. Yeah. Basically, <laughs> basically you're, you're more than average height. Like, like my wife, here's a funny thing. So my wife looked at her old baseball program and, you know, or the website or whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. Like, she looks at me and goes, six feet? You're not fucking six foot. <laughs> they were awful as like, shit. I'm like, I hate you. It was with cleats on, damn it. Yeah, I'm so, wearing boots to fucking recruiting yeah, meetings, I'm, man. Yeah, <laughs> I'm wearing high heels. Fucking not six foot. Ah, oh, come on. <laughs> give me that at least. God dang. So, but yeah, man. So like in my biggest, you know, I'm, I'm up over 320. Um, I'm sitting about 215-ish now. Mm -hmm. And um. So competed, you know, got in a strong man, had a good time with it, powerlifting, did some weightlifting, and finally got into a uh, Highland Games, and it, it clicks. Like, it's just one of those things, especially 2009-ish, that you're talking about. Like, it's a little, it's not quite as prolific on the internet to figure out where to get mm -hmm. into these type of things. Right. So found one, found some people, traveled to start competing in Dallas from Baton Rouge on a pretty regular basis, and then kind of the next year went to competing around the country as an amateur. I would uh, mm. I would schedule sales calls for the job I had 
in areas there would be games and so that I could travel for the week over there to do sales and then uh and then dive back in on competing. Oh, I lost you. There you are. Yeah, there um, you are. Technical given technical difficulties. Um, it's go re re roll. Yeah, so like I would just do whatever I could to get out and compete. And so by the end of 2010, I'd won an amateur world championship and uh 2011, I won Amateur World Championship again, which got me an automatic invite to the professional worlds. Mm -hmm. um, I took second my first year at it and then won the following year, took second, won the following year, and then took a couple seconds, I think, on my way out. Um, by 2016, my right knee was kind of worn out. Mm -hmm. um, I tore ACL while I was in college at LSU, got it fixed and competed and was fine on it. And then during post-college while running a bicycle shop um i started in baton rouge uh i tore an acl at a skate park mm. and um just didn't get it fixed i'm fucking 22 without insurance trying to run my own business i think i'm clearing sure. like 400 bucks a month fucking killing it mm -hmm. very proud to call myself an entrepreneur at that point hey, you bet your hey, fucking that ass. you did you sell the bike you rode over to my house <laughs> Fuck, I probably you know man i was way happier to wear that hat than actually do the work i hear you man i hear you um so got out of that finally you know um struggling and then got a got a real job for 10 years and then got into the games um it's 2016 while i'm kind of toward the end of things things overlap right like so my apparel brand started in 2014 right um and then 2016 was kind of my last time to compete. I went in to do an ACL at the end of a season, just to take a year off, rehab, document it all. I've been doing YouTube mm -hmm. content and everything by this point yeah. for quite a while. And, um, you know, it just never took. So I ended up having yeah. like nine surgeries over the next three years, uh, like five ACLs. Like would go in, get an ACL surgery, rehab for three months. They'd check it out and be like, it's gone. Fuck. ACL again. So I just dove back in. Um, so eventually the knees just trashed. There's just nothing mm -hmm. left in there. So after 2017, um, I'm just full entrepreneur, got let go of my company. And like, man, I can, I'm, I'm traveling with a cane. Like I can't fucking yeah. walk more than about 200 yards a day. Damn. And so go through that for a couple of years of pretty nasty chronic pain, got pretty ugly dark mm -hmm. and a lot of loss of identity and kind of figuring out life on the back end of athletics. Um, total knee replacement finally in 2019 saved my fucking life, man. Wow, man. That's powerful. You know, you're talking about all this, you know, like reclaiming your self identity after athletics is the hardest thing. When I was done, I had no clue who the fuck I was without baseball. You know, I was no longer Sean, the baseball player. I was with Sean. The problem was I didn't know who Sean was, you know, so, you know, down the road, I started doing a lot of stupid shit, burning friendships, burning bridges, doing a lot of things, intentional, you know, like intentional hurting people right mm -hmm. um to where i couldn't say like hey man i didn't know it was like literally i turned into that dude and it was all because i was just so hurt and i had this hole inside of me this just gaping hole in my soul dude i was just heartbroken over how my career ended and the injury that just ended it all and the the shitty ass mindset that that was stuck in it that couldn't allow me to get out of my own you know pool of urine so to speak you know so what, what I'm saying? What injury? How, how did things go for I, you? I had well, it started with the blood clot in JUCO, right? I had the oh, blood shit. clot. I, I almost died. Yeah, I got through that in 2000 and shoot, what was it, man? It was 90 set, so 90, so 99. So it was the, the spring of 99 to where I I literally had to. I mean, I had a scholarship to Louisville um, on the line and. All of a sudden, like I couldn't lift my my catching arm, and I and it was just like like a like a, a bad pull right here underneath. Mm, and just and quit dude, it just it just started. I don't know what it was, man. Then it just started. I started getting a fever, like a really bad fever. It was like a hundred. It like at the peak of it was a hundred and three, but it was consistently at a hundred and two and a half. It was bad, dude, for weeks upon weeks. And I was still fucking playing. I'm like, I have to play. I have to do this and. Mm -hmm. Finally, my girlfriend at the time said, Hey, you know what? You're, you're, you're to a point that you, it was close to Thanksgiving. And I know that because I spent 
Thanksgiving in the fucking hospital. It's my favorite holiday. It's like, you know, like in the fucking people are bringing pumpkin pie. My teammates are bringing me porno magazines. It's like, guys, this is like fucking what am I going to do with this pie after I'm done with this magazine? What the fuck's going on? So Wrong order of operation. Yeah, guys, come on. You guys got this all fucked pie up. first. Yeah, exactly. Save that for next visit. So I, I get through that and they, they said to me, I was laying, I remember vividly, I was sitting there in that hospital bed in, in, in Walnut Creek, California. And they said, Hey, you know, I said, when can I play? Like, can you get me out of here? I got a blood clot. Can you just cut it out? Yeah. But we can't because if it goes too far and it goes to your heart, you're, you're going to die. I'm like, wait a second. We okay. can die. We mean like I'm fucking 19 years old. I'm yeah. fine. Can you just drain this thing? Do whatever you have to do, whatever, you know, blood thinner, heparin or Coumadin mm -hmm. you got to eject me with break this motherfucker up. And I got it like the seasons in a month. Will I be ready? They looked at me and laughed. They go, you know, we have to determine if this is a um, injury due to a trauma or a blood disorder. I was like, well, either one, I don't give a fuck. Like, when can mm -hmm. I play? Well, that's going to be um, depending on what the answer to those questions are. If it's a trauma, we have to put you on blood thinners. I go, cool. How long? Like seven months. I'm like, okay, cool. Like, so I'll just take the blood thinners. I'm good. I play. And they're like, no, no, no. You, you're not playing baseball this year. You're not. I'm mm -hmm. like, cause if a ball hits you, you could bleed and you know, won't stop. I'm like, all right, then don't get, just break it up now. And then don't give me the blood thinner. I'll just go out there and play. Like, that's not the way it works. I'm like, okay, fine. Fuck. What's the second option? Well, we find out that's a blood disorder and you can never play baseball again. I'm like, Phew. turned out to be a trauma. Uh, I guess it, it was caused in a collision. Me and the third baseman trying mm. to get a foul ball and it didn't hurt. I don't know if I fell on it wrong or what, but there's that. Yeah, shit happens. Shit happens, man. At LSU specifically, it was, you know, rotator cuff. I was just, you know, I had the surgery and then it was the year, it was Skip Bertman's final year. And I remember going up to him and said, Hey man, I just can't coach. I just can't throw anymore. Like I can't even ship gears in my, my piece of shit on a prelude. Right. And uh, it was bad. Dude, the bumper was falling off and shit. Come a long way, man. Come a long way. Hear you. <laughs> so, um, I go into him, I, I say, Hey, you know, I'm gonna have to, I, I gotta get surgery to coach. I'm gonna have to take the year off. And he's like, Ooh, that's tough. You were going to split time with, you know, Matt Heath this year. You're gonna get a lot of playing time. I debated. I'm like, well, do I just say fuck it and just deal with the pain and play? But I just realized that there's, you know, 12,000 people at the stadium on Wednesday nights. And if I'm shit, everybody in Baton Rouge is going to hate me. Right. So I was like, no, I should probably get surgery right after my surgery. Um, they were coming up to me, not skip, but like smoke Laval and turtle Thomas were saying, Hey, you need to leave because we got this guy coming in next year. I was like, I just got out of surgery. Like, Come can on. I heal? Can I have an opportunity to get to show you what I can do? I'm here for a reason, right? Well, this guy was Gatorade player of the year. I'm like, I understand he's a stud, but let me lose yeah. by just him beating me out. And so right then it was just when that mindset just shifted. It was just like not good enough. All all the people telling me all the bad shit that I was when I was a kid, I'd never make it without baseball. That volume got really fucking high. Right. That, dude. And it broke me. And, and dude, like I was just a miserable person to be around. And my, my senior year, I ended up working my way up from the sixth of the depth chart to the backup and got 18 at bats. And it just ended poorly. Right. I didn't even get a rep in the college world series. Yeah. And you know, so when I say that, you know, the, the, me finding out who I was afterwards was just so exhausting and tough, right? I feel like now that I'm 44, three beautiful children, a beautiful wife, find out who the fuck I am and what I'm supposed to do. Now I just got to mm -hmm. make it all happen so I could do it full time, right? But there was yeah, a I, bad, there was I think bad it's moment. a fucking bummer that we've convinced people, right, that by 25, they're supposed to have figured it out. How in the fuck is that possible, Matt? Well, so... <sighs> One of the sayings that I like a lot is this idea that like uh, we'll be soldiers so our sons can be farmers and we'll be farmers so our sons can be teachers and we'll be teachers mm -hmm. so our sons can be artists. Mm -hmm. Well, we got there. This is what we're doing. We're in a society now and we have enough abundance that a lot of us can pursue the thing that we're interested in and make a living at it. Mm -hmm. Our parents' generation did sell us on this idea that you can do whatever you want as long as you mm -hmm. work really hard. That's true again. Um, when we graduated, it wasn't, 
it was very much this you can do whatever you want until like okay time to quit being a fucking kid and move on with your life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that comes from like think about our parents generation and how they were raised right like that boomers raised by this post-world war ii generation like these are people the world war ii generation is actually coming out of scarcity where the greatest thing you could do with your life is fucking comfort mm. Can you imagine not having to worry about food? That'd be the greatest fucking gift ever. Can you yeah. imagine air condition or any of this? And so our parents bit hard on that line and built the, built the American dream, the white picket fence, the two and a half kids that not have to worry about food, the 401k and a job you go to every day and don't ever have to worry about it. Yep. Yep. Steady income, salary, yep. salary job. You're good. And yeah. it's not supposed to stay that way. Nothing stays anyway. Like everything's transitional. Mm-hmm. And so in the same way society is there, like we've got to adapt too. there's a reason we don't still have nine kids per family. Like we did it, you know, turn to the, you know, tw turn to the 20th century. Mm -hmm. It adapts with what things are. And so there's going to be us on the front end of the adaptation that realize they don't have to play the regular game and be miserable part of the machine that makes money. Like you can hustle and do your own thing, but it's hard work. Yeah. You know, it's hard work figuring out the puzzle to make your own life of whatever you want it to be and be honest with yourself, or you can sell all your fucking time to a job you don't give a shit about. Mm -hmm. Both are hard. Choose your hard, right? And that's the thing. That's it. There's so, and, and one thing I want to point out too, because I'm caught in the middle of both of them, right? It's mm -hmm. like, you know, they're both very hard, right? But this is the hard that I would want to do full time. Like I want right. to do this, but then I think like, I can't act as if I would, if it was just me and my wife, I have three children to think right. about. I got to do it smart. I got to be, you know, mm -hmm. I got to, got to be strategic. Right. And I just got to, you know, and then the industry will tell you, Hey, just keep doing what you're doing. Someone will find you and it'll, it'll all change. I'm like, no, that's I not how any of this works. shit works, man. And that's not how any of this shit works. You know, you get, you, you pay for act, somebody like, wandering you, out there dying to help I mean, you fulfill your dreams. Get the fuck out of here. Me? Come on, the right person to hear my show. The right people have heard my show. That's just that's not how the world that's works. That's not how right? it works, man. You think that no. there's this moment of like, I get him on it, it's going to change. It doesn't. No, it doesn't. It doesn't do anything, dude. I tell you, man, and you probably notice this too by looking at your own analytics. The shows you think are going to be massive, in and you know, in your in your, you know, whatever your stats, your fucking rankings or whatever the mm -hmm. fuck, your analytics. Those aren't the ones that hit. It's yep. the ones that. No one knows who they are. Like, well, like I mean, it's a variation, right? It also depends on then how you market it and where you share mm -hmm. it and does it get enough eyes and what your audience is mm -hmm. into. Cause I mean, my podcast has been really consistent. Like we're a little over, I don't know, 330, 340 episodes or something like mm -hmm. that since 2017. And the episodes that me and my wife, Bonnie do together perform just as well as me flying a guest in. So Absolutely. if I'm listening to the analytics, right? Like, hell, I'll just have her on. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not strictly how I want to make a show. Like I want yeah. to talk to people I'm interested in. Yeah. And so at some point, like there's the push and shove of I'm going my way and I'll continue to figure it out because I'm aware that there's shows that people talk to the people they're interested in, like uh, Chris Williams or Rogan or any of these others that are mm -hmm. that style with a variety of guests. Um, and they do really well. And then there's people that just chase data and grow their show that way. But to me, yeah. I didn't get into this to have someone else tell me what to fucking make. Mm -hmm. And so if I follow that strictly and it's not in line with what I want to do, then I got a job again. Yeah. It's a really great point you just brought up, brother, because I've had people tell me like, hey, on your show – you don't have a set list of questions that you're asking your guests. Like you need to have, you need to prepare better and ask all these questions. I was like, why? So my fucking guests can feel like they're being interrogated. No, no, no. For anybody with a big show gave you that advice? Fucking. I'm like, it, it wasn't a big show. Well, and I said, be very, be very, it'd be very clear and un understand. It wasn't anybody who had a podcast. It was just somebody from the peanut gallery. And I'm like, sure. I'm not doing that. That's not how I want to do things. Like I want to have an unscripted conversation with really cool people that are successful after overcoming massive amounts of adversity in their life, whatever it is, like if you, your clothing brand doing over seven figures, you know, an amazing podcast, you know, a, a wife doing really cool things. Like don't tell me how to run it because there's no, 
the only way that I know how to do shit is my way. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, no, I, some... I, I agree with it. Right. And like, you know, I hope for you the same way, you know, what I got out of stuff, you know, when my, when my career ended and I wasn't able to throw anymore due to the injury, man, it was one thing, the identity of like, Oh fuck, I can't throw anymore. Like mm -hmm. I'm smart enough to know that shit comes to an end. Right. Like I remember track and field in college coming to an end and all that. Right. And I even remember competing mm -hmm. and being at my best and being at the top and telling people like, look, this is a thing I do. This isn't going to make my tombstone. I love this mm -hmm. shit, mm -hmm. but it isn't who I am. And where I fucked up on that and where the universe decided to challenge me was what if you're not able to move around anymore? Mm -hmm. And I wasn't prepared to not be an athlete. Right. That part I wasn't prepared for, man. And so what dove into that identity really was you know, all of my self-confidence, all of this stuff I had built of being me really came from this machine. Like for me being lucky enough that I got dropped into a machine that that responded to anything I'd basically ever asked it to do as an athlete. Mm -hmm. You know, it got stronger. It was big enough. It could run fast and, and play sports and do all this and learn and get better. And it was athletic. Um, and when that was gone, ooh, now who the fuck am I? Yeah. Yeah. And how, so and like, how I do just, you deal with that? Where does your mind, where does your mind go? Yeah, it's bad because, you know, the first part is just this dark anger and mm -hmm. bitterness around the fucking, how dare the, how dare the universe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, there's so many people out there with good fucking working legs who don't do shit with them. Yeah. You know, yeah, and like mine's going to fucking fail, right? Like I train yeah. my ass off. I do the rehab correctly. Like I know my shit. Mm -hmm. It didn't work out. Yeah. And uh, it's amazing. So it got really dark. I got really bitter. I fucking got annoyed when friends wanted to do stuff that we had to walk to because I can't mm -hmm. fucking go. Yeah. You know, and so I got real shut in and got real shitty. And then constantly being in pain, um, you know, my knee kind of stayed to where a really good day was like a three. Mm -hmm. And then a really bad day, which, you know, could be from I walked 200 yards. Uh, I now get like a stabbing pain in my knee. That's like an eight or a nine, uh, when I exhale right now, now I'm, no, no, no. When it was fun. Oh. Oh, and so wow. like I yeah. get this stabbing pain when I exhale and like, yo, you can't avoid that. And so now the more I know too, right. So now I'm spending probably the better part of two years, chest breathing and constantly staying in fight or flight. So now I'm fucking packing cortisol levels. I'm fucking not wow. sleeping at night. Everything's fucked other than I keep having surgery. Yeah, you know, I'm really honest with myself at that point. Like I'm doing YouTube already, right? And so I'm going into this first surgery with, I'm going to document this. I'm going to show the rehab. This gets people back on the field. I'm going to come mm -hmm. back and win a world championship. Right. Six surgeries later, I'm very aware at this point, like, get back to competing. What the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. You know, we can't walk. And so scared, right? Yeah. Just super fucking scared. And then, you know, trying to even just uh, accept it and the acceptance being like, so all of those adventures and things and hikes and crazy shit, you know, not crazy shit, but adventure I want to take, see the world. Like, so that's done now. Mm -hmm. Like I closed all that door. And that was, that was a really tough one to swallow and, and have acceptance of if we're going to move forward, we've got to kind of deal with it, right? That this is mm -hmm. what we can control. And, um, yeah, I knew, I knew that if I didn't figure out how to get out of chronic pain, like, you know, I don't fucking die of old age. I'm going to end up killing myself. Yeah, of course. Right. And so right. if I, if I'm honest with myself enough to know that I don't know when I lose this fight. You know, if it's a year from now or five years or 15 years from now, but at some point I do, I, I lose the mental fight with this. And if that's the result, then what's any risk of trying to get better? Mm -hmm. Fucking try everything, throw everything at it. And so that launched me into a ketogenic diet because it reduces inflammation, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm not allowed to be okay with that other 
very extreme decision, right? That ending my life or whatever it is, mm -hmm. unless I can say I did everything, but don't bullshit yourself. So change your diet, lose weight and see if inflammation changes it. You know, if there's something that you could be doing that's removing pain and you're not doing it, you're an asshole. Mm. So take accountability for it. I kind of, I quit drinking. Um, cause that was causing more inflammation. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that I can't stay on pain meds. We both, we all know how that fucking long-term yeah. story goes. Yeah, of course. So I know that that's a problem. I've been on them for two and a half years. Luckily for me, whatever the addiction side of stuff is, I really don't. Um, I ended up to use cannabis as help with pain and found a gigantic savior there. Mm -hmm. I was able to sleep again. I was in a better mood and it just, I wouldn't say made pain better. I just didn't give a shit about it. Yeah. yeah which was fine. Yeah. That's cool. You know, it, it's yeah. not like it was better to where I could go train, mm -hmm. but I could survive on a normal basis and be nice to fucking people I was around. Right. Yeah. Um, and so kind of with that one, man, like I didn't smoke or do any of that up until that point, like with college or anything else, I'm too fucking right. scared to get popped on a drug test. Like Jesus Christ. Yeah. I can't think of anything more that. preparing, you know, anything more embarrassing than yeah. losing my scholarship for a fucking drug test. For a fucking um, one night blunt. Fucking oh, stupid. My parents would have fucking burned me at the stake. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so when I started using cannabis to manage it, like I'm, I'm in my thirties and like my life's together. And there's a big part of me that, that really believes all this shit we grew up with. And mm -hmm. then like, I don't know how much, but there's an amount of this that'll ruin my life that I'll become a of fucking course. loser. Mm -hmm. And that's true. Right. You know, I didn't it, find any case of that. Yeah. It's amazing because I'm, I'm listening to this and this is where the listeners are, are just going to love this story because you're having these moments of, I don't know when I'm going to lose this battle. It could be a month from now, a year from now, 15 years from now. But if I don't get out of this chronic pain and not That's throwing everything out, right. It's just like, to me, like when, when someone says to you, like, well, how did you know to move at that point? Like, no, that's the fucking move. Like it's the, Hey, I could, this could end up taking my life in 15 years. And if I don't do anything about this, I'm a fucking asshole. But do you and, follow, you follow Alex Hermosi stuff? Oh, of course, man. Of right. Course. So like, what he talks about with people making a decision, like in the sale, mm -hmm. it's the same deal, right? Like my pain of staying the same mm -hmm. far outweighed the pain of changing. Right. So I changed, mm -hmm. but it wasn't until I reached that point with myself and admitted it that I was able to really go full bore into the other. I think that's true with everything, right? Like whether it's, you know, how you do your sales call, if you're a sales professional, um, you know, realizing you're doing the sales call wrong and you either, you know, hate the pain so much that you're in right now because you're losing, you're not making money. You have to hate that much more than, than the process of the change. Same thing with weight, right? Same thing with not eating like an asshole at night. I'll admit that is when I eat like an asshole. Yeah, same. I, bro, I, once I touch fucking chocolate, it's like a sex addict. It is Dude, bad. I struggled during, uh, during lockdown. I figured out here in I figured out here in St. Louis that like we've got deliver like cookie delivery places. Oh, dude, yeah. Come on, man. Like I wasn't built to be mature enough to fucking no, not hit, no. not hit, hit that button at night. <laughs> oh, absolutely, man. So I mean, it's just so like that's my point though. Like everything in our lives, we can pinpoint the fact that are we in enough current pain, whether it's emotional or physically, right now, to be like. All right, let me move. Let me make a decision, move. right? Because you just have to get so damn tired of that current state that you're willing to make that. And so I think that that's what your average person needs to like start making a change. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think once that you can kind of start mastering more of yourself, right? Like I'm able to kind of look at things, right? That like if I know something's not in alignment anymore, but it's just a little bit out of alignment, like I'm not doing something right, whatever it mm -hmm. is, I've got to feel it. Yeah, But it's not worth changing yet, right? Because the pain's not so bad. But if I can spend some reflection time and say, hey, what is five years of not addressing this look like? Are we then in a problem that we should probably have that we should address because we're really uh -huh. struggling? So why don't we just fucking do that now? Yeah. Yeah. There's too many people, I think it falls into um, instant versus delayed gratification, right? Dude, but that's the best part we got from the athletic thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, what a gift. What, what other people don't get it. 
Mm -hmm. Other people aren't given that, but the athletic thing teaches you all the recipes of success in anything mm -hmm. because what it teaches you is progress. That's all. That's all you should be and shooting. It's not linear. You're aware of that too from the athletic side, right? Dude. That there's going to be plateaus. And whenever you plateau, you need a different stimulus to get a different result. Yeah. Why would yeah. any other part of my life not be the same? If I want my muscles to grow right, like I've got to push them to a certain level of discomfort so that they grow back and adapt stronger. Why mm -hmm. would I emotionally be any different? Why would my risk tolerance be any different? Why would yeah. any of this stuff with my own confidence be any different? Yeah. It's, it's interesting because not a lot of, not a lot of people look at it like that. Like you said, we were blessed with that, you know, mm -hmm. and at times and I can look at it like, like my show and building my brand. And I don't know how it was for you, but it's not fucking linear. Like you said, <sighs> dude, it has been no, dude. a roller coaster. <laughs> I mean, there was a point where, dude, it was getting so toxic for me. I took four months off. I was like, I'm not dropping another show. I'm not doing anything. So what part about it got toxic? I think for me, it was just having to monetize, 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 mm. make money, make money, make money, make money. That's not who I am. Like, I will get results. But like, for me, I want to grow a brand to where, you know, I'm impacting billions of people having conversations with people and my words and my determination, motivation, actually helping them to move forward. And I focused on the wrong thing early on, yeah. right? I was like, okay, I need to do this as quickly as possible. So I don't have to go to work tomorrow. Yeah. The money part, the money part is a side effect, right? Yeah. Like I yeah. look at the money part as a side effect of building a, a building something that's valuable. Mm -hmm. Same way with, I think happiness works the same way. Like, I don't think you can directly become happy. I think right. you can no. create happiness in mm -hmm. your life. So kind of that same deal, man, that, that monetization part's tough because, you know, back again, like, are you following someone else's desire to grow this? And that's one of the reasons for me mm -hmm. with my podcast, you know, I, what I promoted on it was my own stuff. Mm -hmm. I've got my own brand. I've got my own things that I'm able to sell. Mm -hmm. Smart. You know, so, yeah, well, smart. I just looked at it. Like if I'm building anything at this point, like I've got to take all roads. Yeah. And so I mean, Absolutely. YouTube content wise, man, I'm, I'm really proud of the content we've put together on YouTube, man. I've, I, you know, we've probably got, I've probably got 1400 videos on that channel. That's badass, man. For a number of years, I learned how to video edit and shoot. Um, and more recently, like we've got to do some rad projects last year. Yeah. We, uh, I got to work with Indian motorcycles. Oh, wow. That's cool. And so we filmed, uh, like a travel show for them. Damn. Because yeah, you know, I, I love what we do, but I like production. Like I mm -hmm. like the filming and directing and trying to shoot and create a project. Really? Yeah. I didn't think I would, but I, fu I fucking love that. Like part, part of everything I'm doing is a scam to get a chance to do that. that I love it. Right? Like, I, lo that's, I love the for I love the forward thinking. Like I um, love it. <laughs> so, I mean, even 2000, you know, just to give you determined, right? Like what we're talking mm -hmm. about with the show. So I'm growing my YouTube channel, kind of vlogging here and there. And I decide like, man, I'd love to do a travel show. I want to do a travel show at that time, like highly inspired by Bourdain, anybody else. Yeah. Right. But yeah. I'll do this travel show and interview people in strength and conditioning and then kind of document, I get to travel and compete around the world. Fuck yeah. That's cool. And so we had a project I came up with called the drift of lifting. Like I didn't bother trying to get anyone on board to monetize mm -hmm. it. I fucking paid for it. Me and a buddy went out to fucking California and filmed it for a week, edited it and aired it. And we did That's it for sick. five years. No way. Um, yeah, we filmed all those on our own and shot it. We filmed in Iceland one year. We came out to Georgia and shot with like Reese Hoffa and these other Olympic shot putters. We went out to California and shot with Kelly Sturette, Mark Bell, and some other great guys, Jesse Burdick. Um, we went to Iceland one year and shot for 10 days with some friends. Um it, it's been a ride, but like I paid for all that. Like there wasn't someone yeah. fucking fronting that. That was my dream that I paid to fucking put out mm -hmm. in the hope that the return on the investment would be good. And it has been. That's awesome. But that man. gets us to the point where, you know, I, I, after the knee replacement decided like, I got to train for something because yeah. you go into the gym for the sake of health, real struggle. I barely give a shit. I f bro, dude, like I barely give a like shit. This is what here's, you just hit an important point. So I have to interrupt. I'm sorry. All these fitness trainers out there that are telling people, you know what you need to do? Stop eating like an asshole and go to the gym. You know how fucking hard that is for somebody? 
like I, I don't it's not as easy as just making the decision. I am a well, former division one athlete. And for me, we're, we're in a different, we're important. in a different ballpark, right? Like we already have the physical language, language and culture in us because we've trained and got to see response and we've been healthy and know how to build muscle and we understand what foods are good. Mm-hmm. But most people don't even have that metric to start with. Yeah. But and then they point, get into their thirties and don't know how to fucking train at all. And it's too, it's too much to want to go to the fucking gym and not know what you're doing at this age. And you know, possibly be around a bunch of people who used to make fun of you. Yeah, exactly. And you think that maybe are now. And that's, that's my point though. It's like, you know, for you, I'm the same way. Like I just can't go to go. Like I have to, I have to say, I need to train for something like this is something that I need to train for. And I, and I think I have that now, you know, you and I spoke, well, I can't say it on air yet. Okay. Right. Because it was a partnership that you know about that I haven't announced. Yeah, right, right. So to me, that that right there, you know, for me is is more training for that because that has the um, potential to really blow up and be a big thing for me, um, and I need to be the part, right? So yeah, I love that. And look, whenever you do it, let's let's have you back on my show. We'll talk about it. I would love it, man. Especially I would if love you're going to be in and out of St. Louis sometimes. Oh, dude, absolutely. So people, yeah, um, that's right. Know, you're um, in St. Louis now. Yeah, St. Louis, man. That's where my headquarters yeah. and everything is. Yeah, I think I'll be there very very soon. Cool. Um, fucking day. Yeah, man. It So kind of like getting back into training, like I, I'd kind of finally healed up to the point where like, all right, I need something. Mm-hmm. And so I was trying to, you know, contemplate it, right? Because it's, it's fucking, it's a little daunting because mm-hmm. like strength shit, like that's really my bread and butter and that's what I want to do. But like physically I can't, like I'm never going to lift a PR again. And yeah. Great. I'm fucking 40. It's probably, yeah. I'm glad I found out how absolutely strong I could be when I was in pursuit of that. Yeah. Um, and so all those things felt weird. I can't get back into throwing. Like I can't do it. So I was like, fuck it. What about running? I've never run. I'm a big guy. And also what a, what a great lower the bar. I'm not going to be a world champion runner. Mm-hmm. There's zero fucking chance. There's no chance that 40 year old, 250 pound me on a fake knee is becoming a great runner. So the only metric I give a shit about, right, for training for this was how much better at running can I get in 16 weeks if I give a shit about it? Mm. And then at the end of it, I signed up to do a like ultra trail run. So like 20 mile trail run in Bryce Canyon, Utah. And I'm looking at it and the completion time for like, you know, drop dead time is like seven hours. I got to move it like 2.6 miles an hour to finish this thing. Mm-hmm. That's walking. So like I can finish. I'm not trying to go run the whole thing. I don't have a time I'm trying to win by. I mm-hmm. don't care about any of those metrics other than I'd like to be in good enough shape to go to Bryce Canyon and do the event, enjoy it. And I would have put in enough effort that day that when I cross the finish line, I'm empty. Mm-hmm. That's it. And so I trained for it. We went out and did it and filmed it. And um, the project's on my YouTube channel called Fragile. And man, it was great. It was really good. It uh, was a big shift in me to go from being injured as long as I was to now like, oh man, I can take damage again. Mm. Like it's okay to push. I'd been so scared for so long that anytime it hurts, fuck, we're back. We're back in this thing. Yeah. And now I'm aware that like, oh, I can push again and deal with hurt because it, it does go away. Yeah. I think, I think that's a big thing, dude, for former athletes and people that have accomplished a lot of things at a higher level is finding that one thing, right? Mm-hmm. Is finding that one thing and just training and, and make it about that. Put it on the calendar, you know, create a plan and burn the fucking boat, right? Just literally go for it. Um, Are you, you familiar said- with uh, Michael Easter? I Michael feel like, I feel an like... Author, uh, he's got a book, a comfort crisis. Oh, okay. And so one of the things he talks about in the book, and I really love that book. Um, he talks about this idea of a Masogi. And so like once a year, having some big challenge, like some biz- big physical challenge for yourself. And like the rules of it are don't die. Good. And when you pick this challenge, it needs to be, enough that you think as of right now you got less than a 50 percent chance that you could finish it 
That's awesome. And so I did the Bryce Canyon thing, trained for that, and that was fun. It took me a little over six hours to complete. And as look, as an explosive thrower athlete, I've never done anything for six fucking yeah. hours. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then the following year, uh, last year, I decided to uh, do a cycling thing. And so there's a trail across Missouri called the Katy Trail. It's 243 miles, and uh, I set out to train for it, and I rode it in a day. So we, I rode for 21 hours, 22 minutes straight, mm. and uh, it was fun. You know, That's kind of the curiosity awesome, behind that was, like, if I can learn to hydrate and I can learn mm. to fuel myself, what gives up first? Will my body actually give up first if I'm if I'm fueling it, or will this? That. <laughs> yeah, you got to. I want to know. Yeah, you know what I mean, like I want to know when does it start saying, "Oh shit," mm -hmm. because look, we'll stop when I can't move the bike any further. That's like if we get to that point, great. Yeah, we found a max. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah. Not asking for any more than that. Yeah, I think that's a good outlook on it, right? I mean, for me, when when you're talking about, you know, you don't die, and then also there's a 50% chance you won't complete it if it were today. To me, it would be a marathon. Yeah. Or, and a Spartan race. Sure. You know, something like that. And it's like, what I like to do is I like to toy around that I'll look, I'll Google it, and I'll be like, oh, that one's in Georgia. And, ah, fuck, it's in Georgia. I'm not going to go do that. Got three kids. I'm not going to fucking go to Georgia and do this. So, dude, like, I'm, I'll do trail runs, but, like, they're an excuse to now go to a national park. It's beautiful. Right. Like, if I'm going to go yeah. do it, man, I'm here for the enjoyment. <laughs> like Exactly. So, I'm going to dig into that because that's really cool, man. For me, I've been telling myself for so long, marathon, marathon, marathon. It scares me the most. Yeah. Right? And so, I just feel like you know, conquering something like that, it, it really shows the determination of the brand, right? It shows who you are as a person. And for me, I got to dig back into that. So this has been an inspiring conversation for me. Dude. Thanks, like, man. Yeah, absolutely, man. I kind of figured it would be. I knew we'd have some humor at the beginning to warm people up. And if they stuck around this long, there's a lot of really good um, things going on in the conversation. I, I heard one thing um, that you said that I really enjoyed and I picked up on, it was, uh, after your, after your pops passed away yeah. and, and you just started talking about not dead yet. Um, in the lo average life expectancy of the mm -hmm. men in your family, and you started deducing like, okay, how much time do I have left? And then uh, to me, that's where, fuck, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. 1612, 1612 weeks left. Right. At and one. At 31. So talk, so talk to the audience about that, like kind of the, the perspective, walk them through that whole story. Cause they may not have seen it or heard it. Sure. You know, my, uh, in 2014, my, uh, or, you know, 20, 2013 in May, my dad gets diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Yeah. So we go through that awful process and my grandma you know, really, that. yeah, it's, yeah. you know, as soon as my mom got the news, right. And like, this is before we're even saying the term cancer. Mm -hmm. There's, there's just something, there's a, a space, a spot on a yeah. image or whatever it was. Right. Yeah. So I Google pancreatic cancer and I'm like, Oh, I killed Steve jobs. And I was like, mm, mm -hmm. we're probably not going to get out of this one. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, watched over the next 11 months, man. Like I just watched him fucking shrivel up and fade away and to go from, you know, who my dad was, right? Like this outdoors guy and a strong guy and a capable man to, and not being able to get around the house and go outside. And I remember the last time I put my hands on him, man, and it just wasn't there. He just Damn. was just wasn't there, right? And the fear of that was like I know the body goes at some point. Mm -hmm. But to to look at it from this perspective of like, oh, he's not sick in his head. He's trapped. Like his brain still knows how to do all the things he loves and they're all just outside the door. He just physically can't fucking go anymore. And so having some real empathy for him, you know, through that process and kind of what clicked for me is, you know, there's a chance that that's how it goes. There's a chance that no matter what I do, what choices I make or anything that it ends fucking horribly with me shriveling up and fighting some awful fucking disease and losing all sense of who I am and everything. So the ride's got to be worth it. Mm. If there's a chance that that's how I go, the ride between here and there has to be worth it. 
and uh thinking about it at that point right like so he's 62 when he passed passed the day before my birthday and kind of reflecting more of that was that just bit hit hit with bricks of you're halfway you're halfway through your fucking life mm. and what does that really mean what are we doing with our time and what that means is i got 1612 weeks left to fucking do everything i've ever dreamed about that's it get on the fucking clock man because because just for perspective 1612 weeks is gone and how quick did it feel like we got here mm -hmm. and so at that point like really looking at each week and so i have this jar of marbles that i keep that started with 1612 and now has 1133 in it as of today sunday um be 1133 32 tomorrow and uh i pull my marble out and i do some reflection and i journal and the questions i asked myself was how was it spent did I spend it doing a bunch of shit I feel obligated to do in my life that I'm supposed to do that I'm, I'm trying to live for other people and do all this? Or did I spend it being present around people I fucking love doing things to set my soul on fire and choosing to make progress all the time toward my mm -hmm. goals and my dreams? Because either way, I put it in the fucking trash. It's not more valuable one way or the other. It's fucking gone. So if no, if you're not getting any extra reward or you're not a martyr for one way and you're not a fucking special, you know, person for doing it the other, there's no risk. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, I, I just decided to live differently. Dude, it's one, and here, and here's the thing, man, like I, I love that. And it's a, it's a visual, it's a reflection. It's, you know, you're looking at that jar and you're like, okay, one more marble, one more week gone. Did I live it according to me being present around the people who give a fuck about me and who I give a fuck about? You know, again, the large part of the population, right, is going to, in, in that face you're making, you know where I'm going with it, yep. man. It's, it's sad because they have, that, they have that moment like you had. And yet they can't get through week fucking two. And they wave their white flag and it's done. And they just said, you know what? I'm a passenger on this ship. And this is just what it's going to be. What would you say to those people? Look, man, if you're happy being a passenger, I ain't here to fucking argue with you. Yeah. The truth is, I don't fucking care if you don't care about your dreams. But if you do, I'm into it. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest fucking rule of all is you're not allowed to let someone else care about your dreams more than you. It doesn't work that way. And right. I damn sure don't care about someone else's more than mine. You should. Right? Yeah. And that's not like I, I don't get to be an asshole because of that. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean I get to get in the way. It means I'm free to pursue my fucking dreams at whatever passion I want, as long as I don't ever pretend it's more valuable than someone else in chasing theirs. Right. I can't ever right. get in the way. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You know, for those people that don't give a shit, right on, man. <laughs> yeah. Right on. Because look, I'm fucking haunted by it. Yeah. No, I, I hear you. I hear you. And I, it's funny because I'm, I'm getting to the point where I'm like thinking, and I, I don't know if you're a parent, um, but no. I start, I did yeah, I didn't think so, but I, I'm sitting there and I'm like looking at my kids. I'm thinking, fuck, did I do everything I could have today to stay healthy? Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, did I, did I ingest anything that could come back and boomerang on my ass? Like what's going on? Because those three children deserve to have me healthy in here as long as possible. And right. not just that, right? Like, look at the advantages, you know, so not having kids and being able to kind of reflect on things in life too. Like, I really believe there's so much that comes from childhood that creates like our base self. Mm -hmm. You know, this idea that I have about, you know, we are this accumulation of the experiences and things that, that we're surrounded by, the people we're around, the community we're in, right? Like, uh, where did, where'd you grow up? I grew up in uh, Concord, California, the San Francisco okay. Bay. So I grew up in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And so exposure to religion, all these type of things growing up, right? Like my mom being Methodist, my dad, you know, kind of being involved in the church thing, but we went every Sunday. And so one of those questions like I have from my mom is like, did you choose Methodist because it's the best philosophy that fits with what you agree with? Or are you Methodist because of where you were born? She's like, well, I've never thought of it that way. I was like, so if you were born on the other side of the world, would you be Muslim? Is it just that simply as what, what landed you here? Or did you choose Methodist because it best fits what you align with? 
Mm. Did you look at the other options? Do you know what they are? And so like at that point, I kind of look at everything of creating the, the best self that I want to be from my base self. You know, my base self is what's generated by all those experiences. The who's and what's I was born around, the kids I went to high school with, what their parents were like, X, Y, and Z. And whether I was more into it or less into it. Mm -hmm. You know, whether my dad pushed me really hard and it made me go this way because I was turned off by it or I responded well, whatever it means. But nonetheless, I didn't pick any of those things. Mm -hmm. But if I can honestly say that I am some accumulation of those situations, then to create the best me, what are the situations he needs to be around that creates that? Mm. So that's picking the people that I want to be around. That's picking the material I want to consume and be, you know, that I want to integrate into my life. That's choosing things that are difficult. That's leading and taking action because it's those actions that make us who we are. Not what we say. What we say means jack shit. Yeah. Yeah. It's the actions we take every day. And like with your situation of having kids, man, I think about, you know, my, my parents were great. We're fucking, we're great. Um, However, now that I'm, you know, 40 and trying to get other shit done, neither of my parents were entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. I'm aware of what setback that is now. Oh, shit. Yeah, I'm like, man. Jesus Christ, if I would have grown up in an environment that thought this way or looked at finances in some other way than what the typical boomer generation does of mm -hmm. like money comes in and then we hold on to it forever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can't do that. You can't, you know, you know? it's like. Yeah, different ideologies, man. I feel that. Right. For sure. You know, if my parents would have said like, oh, when the money comes in, look, we bought this rental property because we still have access to the money and the way that you can finance it and you can leverage equity yeah. to be able to, Jesus Christ, why couldn't we have learned any of this? Yeah. Like what the Instead, fuck? I got fucking 10 weeks on diagramming sentences. Like you don't think maybe something yeah. a little bit more, you know, could have helped. Yeah. Um, yeah. I failed diagramming sentences and have written three books. So fuck use was that. Yeah, seriously, I've, I've written one book. That's it, right. just one, just one. But like they're mostly training manuals, they're nothing fancy. <laughs> but but there's but they're three books. But they're fucking books. I said I'm going to write a book, and I wrote a book. You know who you need permission from to write a book? No one. You. That's <laughs> it. Own, write a fucking book. You can self. publish it yourself. Everyone thinks okay. there's some fucking gatekeeper in life that you're asking permission from. Dude, I think it's I think that's where they're out of alignment with their confidence. We talk about confidence. Confidence isn't something that is just there. It is it's earned good. on a day-to-day -day basis by the fact like, are you keeping your fucking word? Like, are you keeping your word to yourself? And from that, you can either be very, very confident or you can fall off and you can start to lose confidence. And when those people start to fall off and lose confidence, they have if to- If they ever had it. If they had it, exactly, right? They could go through th their whole fucking life having to look for that external. Now, as athletes, we always kind of lived and died on what other people thought of us and what the accolades were. Did we perform well? But on a personal level, that has bled over into me as a young adult that I've really had to fix. It's like, dude, I got to tap into me a little bit more. Fuck what they think. I know mm -hmm. what I'm capable of. I like the Sean French at six years old thought he could fly like fucking Superman. Right now, probably, probably not the best, you know, activity to try, but like, dude, we thought we could conquer the fucking world. It's yeah. like, be that kid, be that child. Like I have big hopes and aspirations for this fucking thing. And I'm not laying off. I am not no. laying off. I'm going to no point actually, of me as a kid said, I'm going to hang out for 50 weeks a year under fluorescent lights, doing a job. I don't like <laughs> exactly none, you know, but I'm, I know enough about me and the way that I've traveled and got to spend time and do things. And I've slept really fucking great in hammocks and I've slept really fucking poorly in expensive beds. Yeah. And so if that ain't the thing that does it for me, I'm damn sure not selling you my happiness for the idea of an expensive bed. I love it, man. I I'll love happily it. live in a fucking van and be a nomad. That'd be good. It'd be yeah, fun. It's great fun. We leave tomorrow mm -hmm. for a road trip. We got three weeks. Where y'all going? We're going to go up to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. I've never no done shit. anything up there. Okay. It uh, should be kind of cool. A bunch of lakes, rad stuff dude. on both Lake Superior, Lake Michigan. I've got a big, stupid truck that's kind of overlanding rig. Okay. So roof tent and okay. my chick will disappear off the grid for as much as we can Fuck for the next three go, weeks. Man. And look, the beauty of building the business I have is that I purposely built it to be remote. Like I know I need to fuck off. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I'll... I'll burn it all down. Like I know I'll hit the fucking detonate button on my own shit. I know this. Exactly. Yes. Like yeah. so I'm done lying to me that I'll do that. Yeah. Yeah. So like, yeah. Look, asshole, you know that you'll do this. You're gonna so fuck up. You're gonna hit it. Don't. 
Yeah, don't yeah. build yourself into that trap. Build a machine yeah. that you can leave. Mm -hmm. And that's you know, the thing. Does that think... cost me probably revenue if I would have focused as much energy on my business? Sure. But mm -hmm. being super fucking rich isn't my goal. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I want to spend my fucking weeks doing what I want to. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the, the biggest misconception when people that don't know what I'm really trying to pull off understand. I, I'm not looking to be the fucking richest man on the planet. I'm I'm looking to to have more of the f word with my family as fucking freedom. Period. Mm -hmm. In the story, I want to be able to fucking disappear from tomorrow to a week from now, and everybody I love is with me. I don't need anybody's fucking permission. To me, that is life. That is what we should all be chasing. Not permission from our boss. Not you know permission mm -hmm. to take PTO if we've performed well. That's not what we're here meant to do. Now, again, I'm not slamming W-2 employees because I'm a W-2 employee as well. But what I'm saying is you have to think differently as it comes to terms of how you want to live your life because one is empowering and the other one is not. Yep. Yeah, both are both are the same action. It's the mindset. Yeah, man. Right? And the mindset, like one thing I've got to be able to admit, right, that my mindset on a situation does control my reality of it. Mm -hmm. You know, if I think I'm being attacked, most likely I handle it that way and I respond poorly. And if I can act out of abundance and not take things personal and manage my side of the situation, I handle things differently and the progress sure. goes another way. Yeah. But the reality yep. is my perception of it. Yeah. And so the yeah. better I'm in control of my own headspace, my mindset and my perception, I get to control my reality. Mm -hmm. And I can either look at challenges as opportunities to sharpen my fucking ax and prove that I'm capable of handling the next thing the universe wants to throw my way, or I can cower. Mm -hmm. And failure is such a fucking lie. Yeah. This yeah. fear of like, I mean, how many people I know that want to take a move and go all in on their own and they're, they're scared because of financial or any of this. And so, you know, my questions are, it's like, you know, give it, give it hell with all the extra hours you've got. Right. And yeah. don't quit your day job. Like build this in your spare time. But if you can't, don't pretend you really want it. Mm -hmm. That's cool too. Yeah. I you mean, know, for, the it, audience, it, for the audience's reference, it's fucking Sunday and here we are, right? Here we are. It's fucking Sunday. I'm recording a show with a badass fucking person. It's like, yeah, I don't we care do what day we have week to it is anymore. I just, it's a fucking day, man. It's a day. It's a day. It's a day, but there's no day to just shut down, man. Like, if you have a dream and it's something that you want to do, to your point, do it in the hours that you can. Dude, I had, a, I had an outside sales job, you know, similar to you, right? Like mm -hmm. I've got an outside sales job making somewhere 150 plus a year with a truck and all this mm -hmm. other type of shit. But there's still some part of me that built a business in my spare time. Yeah. You know, I thank that lunatic. Yeah. I thank oh, that yeah, guy at whatever age was like, yeah, we'll give this a go. Yeah. Instead of putting my feet up and trying to go to fucking Gulf Shores again for another week. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I've been. I know how that fucking story plays. I don't want to be on autopilot anymore in my life. Mm -hmm. I want some part of my day dedicated to my future. Yeah, yeah. I think it's important, man. I, I just think that, you know, there's got to be enough individuals out there willing to fucking be self-aware enough to know that. And it, and it's just don't lie to yourselves, though. If you don't take the time to do it, don't say you want it because now you're just talking shit like that's right. that's bullshit. Like fucking be real. Right. And but, even the uh, other little honesty shit that I catch myself with now, right? Of like, um, yeah, I'm I'm a terrible carpenter and woodworker. Mm -hmm. You made that axe throwing thing. That was cool. <laughs> sure. I fucking screwed some stuff together in a square. But there's <laughs> part of me that's like, oh, I don't want to do that because I'm a bad carpenter and woodworker, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And then if I look at it and say, but like I'll feel like, well, I'm not a runner. I'm mm -hmm. not a woodworker, right? Like it's some type of genetic trait that I should have yeah. had figured out by now. Yeah. Yeah. When in fact, why the fuck would you be? You've never picked up a hammer. Mm -hmm. Like maybe use a hammer for six months to see what you learn and decide if you're a woodworker. Mm -hmm. You can't do something it's once a, and just suck at it and say like, well, I'm just not that guy. Dude, the rest of my life, I just want to be bad at shit and steal mm -hmm. as many like white belt lessons. And I want all the beginner gains. Yeah. From yeah. as many different things as I possibly can. Fucking, that's a fail, fail once it gets fucking, hard. Let's go, man. That's fucking, whew, that fucking, yeah, but, you know how that fucking line goes. That's it, right? They just yeah. steal all the beginner gains in as many things. Like imagine if you spent eight months doing jujitsu mm -hmm. and then move on to the next thing. Yeah. You've separated yourself from the bell curve of fucking people. Yeah, because you're constantly doing different shit. You're, you're yeah. willing to suck at something. 
you know, and I think that is something that society is so scared to do. They're willing so to so scared to do. Man, you're only allowed to suck at stuff for so long. Embrace it. Yeah. yeah, just fucking go for it. Might as well. I mean, this show fucking sucked. I mean, it sucked. And I'm gonna look back and you know, I'm, I'm fast forward ten years. I'm gonna look back and be like, man, it sucked on that day because you ha- it's progress, right? Mm-hmm. Like you're allowed to get better. Show everybody everything so everybody can see the journey. That's inspiring. Right. That's when people say like, fuck, I remember listening to not dead yet when it was the first episode. Now we're 300 episodes deep and look at this motherfucker. Yep. You know, yeah, we have a studio. We get to bring people in. Yeah. Oh, it's continued to grow, but it hasn't continued to grow because the show needs it. It's because I want it Mm -hmm. because I want to put out the best quality product I can. That's what I'm excited about. Right. Like I want to build a space that I'm like, I'm inspired to work in. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I built that. my own fucking spaceship that I'm inspired to hang out in and, mm-hmm. and and work with. And so now it's been really fun here in St. Louis. We built we built dope my uh, my studio. So that's a division of performance enhancement. That's cool. Uh, I'm here for <laughs> anybody cool. who wants to get fucking better, man. That's really um, cool. Anything out the there? Table. I'm gonna when I'm out there, I'm gonna come see you though for sure. Dude, please, please, I'm gonna, man. Have to, I'm gonna have to fly in a day early or stay a day more. Yeah, you're so welcome to. I got up, space man. here too. Be fucking dope, man. Yeah, I got no space for you. Can, you can crash with us. Sick, uh, bro. Sick. Yeah, you know, the gym. Yeah, like I built out the space. It's all decked out with Sorenex stuff. I've worked with them a long time and uh, built my podcast studio in there. And then nice. now my like my, my my office is there. So that's where I've just spent all day. Mm-hmm. And I treat the gym now with it, you know, just being available all day and private in my own that like it's a it's like a full body fidget spinner. That's fucking. <laughs> and so, like through the day, like if I run into like a problem and I get frustrated, like go fucking do a thing, <laughs> go do some come back. Go that's do it. That's it. Right. Digits. This yeah, one's great for me. Oh, he's stressed again. He's doing fucking arm curls. <laughs> and then we we randomly just decided, my wife and I decided, like fuck it, let's open the door. Mm-hmm. And so we threw a Halloween party and just put it up on Instagram, free for anyone who wants to come. To, you know, my audience and her audience, hers is mm-hmm. over 200 and mine's, you know, 100 plus And yeah, let's see what happens. And what we realized is like you know, real weirdos and people that talk shit don't show up in person. No, they don't. Your, your people do. Yeah. It's so like yeah, we exactly. had like 80 people show up, yeah. man. And yeah, it's fucking some, awesome. I had some fucking dickhead today. Um, like all my boys like post. Mm-hmm. My buddy Derek Fay. He's here locally. He's doing a lot of great things. He's blowing up. And I, I support him, you know, I know what he's built here in our community and I'm always just spewing positivity. And this is some asshole from New York with like a page of like 1600 people <laughs> and it comes to me and goes, stop with the bullshit. I'm like, I'm not. That's, it. That's his whole response with, with stop. He goes at Sean, at the Sean French, stop with the bullshit, crying face, crying face. I was like, stop supporting my friends. Got it. Like, Dude, you know what? We're, we're so conditioned, right? To like see that comment and give it a response. Fuck those people. I shouldn't have. I should. No, I don't give them. No, so like any of that, right? Like even the two minutes or 30 seconds it takes to response. Yeah. You know, that's, that's my energy that I could have put on my thing. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck those exactly. People. Yeah. Good point. Good point. I have I was no like, interest in people. anyone who, who isn't into it. Yeah, I'm talking to people with their fucking hands up. Yep, yep. That's it. I yeah. only talk to positive comments. Yeah. I don't give yeah. fuck about these other people. I'll happily block you. Fuck off. It's fucking crazy, man. It's just need it's just you like, to support like, me. I don't give a shit. Yeah, it wasn't even my post. I'm like, dude, fuck off, right, man. Right, even, right, right, right. Support my dude here. Like, what the fuck, man? But you know, uh, I just, don't, I just don't have time for it. I'm yeah. just not interested, right? That like I surround, I'm in control of the energy I surround myself with, and I'm going to surround, my, and I'll be fucking hard on that boundary. But yeah. that's me to hold. Yeah, if sure. you come around with complaints and bullshit, we ain't hanging out. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. I like it. You got to go, toxic, dude. It's toxic, right? It's just it's Control one of what you like, can. Imagine like it's just like that oil and water, right? You just throw it together and it fucking it, it freaks out. Like when you're in a certain energy and you're you're vibrating on a certain level, and someone comes in talks about how bad life is, you're like, the fuck, you're what alive. What are you doing about it? Like, what are you gonna do about it though? You're fucking alive, like. I'm, I'm not, you know, I spent, you know, an hour and a half at my buddy's son service yesterday. I mean, yeah. I was fucked up 18 years old, man. Like, yeah. like, listen, 
And into your into your point, not dead yet. Like I'm still here. Like, and I don't know when that time's gonna expire. So like I just I just feel like more people need access to energy and more people need access to people like you because like brother, like I absolutely love everything you're about. And you're kind, you're a nice guy, you you're 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 shooting to build something. I'm even glad the nice guy thing kind of goes back historically, right? Like I didn't show up. Does. You. <laughs> I mean, he kind of does. He's like, oh, I just like showed up at your doorstep to say hi. Yeah, <laughs> right. Not know. quite why I was there, but yeah. Oh my god. Oh man. I, I I tell you what, dude. I've I've told that story so many times in my whole and since then. Since then, like I. So so I, when you when you so this is something I'm fascinated, right? Because yeah. your perception of that incident is so much different than mine. I want to hear your perspective. Yeah. All right. So, so my story is like, I figure out my chick's cheating on me. Mm -hmm. I track down a phone number. I think I probably tried to call you. And like, I, I, I did. And then like, of course, no one wants to fucking deal with me. I may have got your fucking number, your address from you. <laughs> I, I, you seriously, I may have. And I'm like, dude, I'm not trying to fucking pick a fight with you. I just want to talk about this. Yeah. I didn't know you were coming. Yeah. And so it, it did. And then went over there. I'm sure I was nervous as fuck. Cause like you were, you weren't on the other side of it, <laughs> but I'm also showing up alone on a fucking bike. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I know that this is the commons, dude. There's four dudes at least hanging out in this apartment. And most likely there's about, they got five. There's about five to seven. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Like I'm not coming in there to fucking bring the ruckus and get the shit beat out of me. <laughs> so I'm aware of all those things too going into it. I'm sure yeah. when I knocked on the door, I bet my heart was fucking pounding like shit. You you seem nervous, man. I'm and, sure. And, yeah, and I was like, probably this probably the same amount of nervous, dude. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 So, so like, you, it's funny to me that like, so you've retold that story. What is yeah. your telling of that story? So like my per my perception of that story is knock knock, right? Um. My buddy, I think, I think it was a friend that answered the door and he's like, I heard Sean French here and he's like, yeah, he's right here. So I come up and you're like, Hey, do you know, you know, Candace? I'm like, yeah, he goes, that's my girlfriend. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Sick. I didn't know. I, I didn't know you want to like, you want to come in cause we were drinking. Yeah, yeah, you wanna, yeah. You have some beers. Like you want to. It's Baton Rouge and it was after dark. What, what yeah, else it was we fucking <laughs> I mean, it's not like this motherfucker showed up in the daytime. Okay. <laughs> no. He showed up at night. That's when shit goes down. So I'm like, okay, come in. Let's talk about this. You know, cause I was nervous and I, and at the point I was like a little scared. I'm like, this dude's huge, Fuck, man. Like, I'm yeah. like, and I didn't know, like if it, if I had any indication, it wouldn't have freaked me out so bad. I'd be like, tell that motherfucker I'm not here. Like what the fuck? You know, but sure. I didn't know. I'm like, who the fuck is this guy looking for me? I don't know this guy. Um, you know, I saw you around, right? Like if we're running and puking on the track and like, you're there working, like yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I yeah. Knew you, but like, yeah, man. Like, so that's my perception of the events. Like you came in and it was cool. We talked about it. I, 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 I was overly apologetic. Right. And yeah, my, I don't remember there being like any friction to our conversation no, whatsoever, we had which is time. most likely why it's a relatively I mean, it would be a bigger memory if we ended up fucking having a brawl in your living room with like me and seven dudes. And exactly, exactly. <laughs> but it was memorable to me because like I remember stupid shit that I've done, right? And yeah, and like, and I remember, and I I called my boy yesterday. I was like, "Hey, dude, do you remember that night?" And he's like, "Yeah, why?" I was like, "Well, I, me and this motherfucker are connected now, and we're gonna hop on a show tomorrow." He goes what really i'm like yeah bro i'm like uh, and, and, and he's just like well you know to be he's like to be fair he's like that night wasn't a big deal like he came in we had some drinks we kicked it and that was it yeah. and i'm like fuck man but yeah dude that was uh, um the audience is like oh, we're gonna hear this shit again like fuck uh, yeah you know, this is my show yeah, fuck imagine it. anyone having that situation re-pop yeah. up and connect like, to do like a professional thing later, later in life like yeah i didn't say it hey Come stay at my house when you come to St. Louis. Uh, I promise, go on this, I promise we'll go on this podcast and talk to this guy. My ex-girlfriend blew. It's fucking great times. 
<laughs> my listeners are like, oh my God, Sean, oh, you did. So so, funny, they're like, yeah, come, come, come stay with me in St. Louis so I can kill you with one of my hatchets. It's like, yeah. what the fuck, you know, but uh, Jesus, dude, man, unreal. But uh, listen, man, we got to land the plane here. Um, yep. Absolutely. Super psyched. We're, we're adults now and we're connected. Uh, we got a friendship now and we're going to be seeing a lot of each other. I'm sure I'm going to be on your show. Um, and dude, just because I'm going to share this as well, where can my audience find all your stuff? Yeah. So they can find the determined society on Apple, Spotify, you know, um, what's the other ones? iHeartRadio, radio, Google yeah, cast, all the, all the fucking major platforms. And then, um, my, my Instagram handle, you have that, um, you know, all that good shit. So, yep. you know, they can come on over and, uh, you know, they can have fun conversations with me there and I'm jacked up, dude. This is going to be, it's going to be great. I'm looking forward to many more interactions and much more laughter and, uh, Dude, you just enjoy your fucking three week vacation. I'll oh, try yeah, not man. to bother you. I try to have as many once in a lifetime trips a year as possible. That's fucking awesome, man. We we'll just look got good. back from uh, ten days on a on a motorcycle. We because uh, I did that thing with Indian last year. We did three big like one thousand mile road trips that we filmed, no which we bit off so much more than we could chew on production. Fuck. Dude, filming four people on bikes, like with a gimbal behind a van and like two cameramen. And like, we're doing all of it. We didn't fucking hire anyone. It's me and my 26 year old cameraman and a buddy of mine from Baton Rouge. Uh, we got no. it done though. <laughs> You're going to teach me how to fucking produce my shit. Cause I fucking yeah, man. fuck at it. Like I, the, the video, the, the cutting it up. I was just like, dude, need to learn it. Need right to on. learn it. So, all right, man, look, dude, I'll be in touch and, uh, thank you so much for, uh, giving the audience so much to, to think about and learn about and, you know, showing who you are to them. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, man. I appreciate the time. Of course, my brother. Talk soon. Talk soon.